Hi, I'm Kristen Goodwin on this episode of the Fox News Rundown. While President-elect Joe Biden continues to move ahead with his transition plans, Republicans are shifting their attention to two runoff elections in Georgia, where the outcome will determine which party controls the Senate. GOP Senator from Florida Rick Scott discusses his party's chances of sweeping the peach state, what he expects from a Biden administration, and the hopeful news about COVID-19 vaccines after recently testing positive for the virus himself. Amid a surge of coronavirus infections across the nation, health officials are pleading with Americans to forego travel and large gatherings this holiday season. Fox News Headlines 24-7 reporter Carly Shimkus shares insight on how folks are making the best of Thanksgiving during these challenging times. Plus commentary from Fox News contributor Pastor Robert Jeffress. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcast.com. I'm Tyrus. I'm Liz Clayman. I'm Greg Jarrett. And this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. I'm Lisa Brady. The president-elect says America is back, but some Republicans in Congress are wondering, back to what? I'm afraid that if we go back to policies like the Obama policies, we'll be in the same position again, where, where if you start out poor, you don't have much of a chance in this country because there's not, there's not a lot of job creation. I'm Chris Foster. It's going to be a different kind of Thanksgiving for people taking coronavirus precautions. That's what people love about Thanksgiving is, you know, sharing food and getting together and watching football on the same couch. And um, the CDC uh, guidelines do not want you to do any of that. We speak with Fox News Headlines 24-7 reporter Carly Shimkus. And I'm Robert Jeffress. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. A day after President Trump cleared the way for a transition to officially begin, President-elect Joe Biden formally introduced several cabinet picks to the nation. They'll tell me what I need to know, not what I want to know, what I need to know. To the American people, this team will make us proud to be Americans. It was a reintroduction for some, including former Secretary of State and presidential candidate John Kerry, now in line to serve as a new cabinet-level climate change envoy. Even the United States, for all of our industrial strength, is responsible for only 13 percent of global commissions. To end this crisis, the whole world must come together. Some of the nominees would make history. The first woman to lead the intelligence community. The first Latino and immigrant head of Homeland Security. But enough former Obama administration officials to draw criticism from both Republicans and progressive Democrats. President Trump still calls it a rigged election, tweeting that he's fighting hard. But he didn't mention the ongoing legal challenges or take any questions during two White House appearances Tuesday, including the annual turkey pardon. On behalf of the entire Trump family, I want to wish every American a healthy and very happy Thanksgiving. Which followed brief remarks on the Dow hitting 30,000 for the first time. That's a sacred number, 30,000. Nobody thought they'd ever see it. Especially after dropping to 19,000 in March. And the Dow's new milestone was reached as the U.S. was crossing another COVID threshold. 259,000 deaths. The president-elect has already described the need for more coronavirus relief as urgent. But a lame duck Congress doesn't seem any more likely to bridge the gap between the trillion-dollar packages passed by House Democrats and the Senate Republican call for a smaller, targeted approach. Well, first off, you know, Republican senators have passed two bills, you know, helping the people that have lost their jobs. Florida Republican Senator Rick Scott is the new chairman of the Senate GOP's campaign committee. We have uh, extended PPP, money to open schools, more money for testing, more money for vaccine. And unfortunately, the Democrat senators have blocked it. Not one senator has voted with us. So it's really completely being blocked by uh, Democrat senators. And what I say what we're not going to do, we're not going to put up money to bail out uh, the pension plans of, of blue states. I mean, it's not... I mean, sort of taxpayers are not going to pay for the pension plans of California, Illinois, or New Jersey. So I think what we're, we're dealing with is the Democrats will have a bunch of liberal priorities that they want, and we want to do a bunch of things to help Americans, and the Democrats 
or have no interest in helping Americans. They just want their liberal priorities. Right. And I mean, that debate will continue because from their perspective, they just keep saying, right. well, especially Speaker Pelosi keeps saying Republicans basically aren't willing to spend enough to crush the virus. Well, to crush the virus is, is testing. Um, you know, we have um, put up billions of dollars uh, for tests. We bought up the Abbott tests. They're being sent around the country. Around the around the country through the governor's offices, the uh, the money we've sent to the states for testing has not been much of that has not been used. So what's fascinating is the Democrats just don't want to. They just want they just have a, a wish list, and a lot of it is they just want to bail out states. And and when did a Florida taxpayer become responsible for the Illinois state uh, pension plan? I mean, it's just, actually it's almost as simple as that. I wanted to ask how you're feeling because you are one of several U.S. senators who tested positive for COVID just last week. Are you having any symptoms? I'm fine. It, I, my, I have a very mild uh, case or like a, a little bit of allergies or a slight cold. So I'm doing great. Um, I look forward to getting back up uh, to D.C. Hopefully we, we will uh, uh, be able to pass uh, our, you know, our budget. Uh, which has been frustrating to me that we haven't passed a budget, and hopefully we can do it in a fiscally responsible manner when I get back. As a Republican, are you relieved that the president has allowed, essentially, the transition process to begin? Well, look, I, I, we still need to make sure all legal votes are cast. We know still need to, uh, the president still has the right to go through uh, the, the legal you know, questions he has. We still need to look for the fraud. I mean, I think what's frustrating is the American public doesn't feel comfortable that this election was fair. Uh, I've got a bill uh, called the Voter Act, which will actually do mail-in ballot the way we do it in Florida, which has worked. But you've got to you've got to have signatures match. You've got to you can't have same-day registration. You've got to have voter ID. You've got to do the things to make American public feel safe about these elections. Because it's not just going to be this election; it'll be the next election. When when are we going to start feeling uh, secure about our election system if we don't? have a conversation and, and pass the bills that are going to make sure we have national standards and locally run elections. In terms of the president's legal challenges over this election, though, I mean, at a certain point, could it hurt the Republican Party for those challenges, you know, to continue? Or just does that just become less of a factor now that the transition's getting underway? Well, I think it's, it's all tied to when the state certify and so they're going through that process. The, the legal challenges will be heard. I went through this two years ago. I won handily um, by 54,000 votes election night, and Chuck Schumer sent a lawyer down the next day. And, and he, he's, not doing, he's not saying what, what Donald Trump said. Donald Trump says, I want all the legal votes counted. What Chuck Schumer's lawyer said, I want to win to the court systems. I don't care what the voters decided. So what, what Donald Trump is doing is exercising his legal right to make sure all Votes, legal votes are counted and make sure there's no fraud. And so that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, but these states are going to be certifying and, and we'll know who uh, the, the president's going to be, uh, I think, pretty quickly. I know that Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame wrote recently about a number of Republican senators who he says have expressed extre extreme contempt for the president you know, behind the scenes or in conversations, but who also stayed silent about that and helped enable what he calls the president's most grievous conduct through their silence. He puts you on that list. Uh, what do you say about that view of the president and lawmakers who have supported him? It's ridiculous and it's completely untrue. Is there any concern that that reaches voters, that that affects, you know, the long-term goal of winning back the White House if the president has lost it, or even these Senate races in Georgia that are coming up in January, the runoffs? Well, we're going to win the Georgia races, and we're going to win because we have very good candidates, and we're on the right side of the issue. And, and I think Georgia voters realize that they don't want Chuck Schumer uh, doing what he said. He was going to take Georgia and then change the country. And he says, we don't want uh, Chuck Schumer's plan for the country. He wants to pack the Supreme Court. He wants to infringe on our First Amendment rights, our Second Amendment rights. He wants to uh, eliminate uh, private health care coverage. He wants to ruin Medicare uh, for the Medicare recipients. He wants the Green New Deal, which will cost almost $100 trillion and kill our economy. And as we know, the Democrats are not into supporting law enforcement. So, 
So I, I'm very comfortable we're going to win in Georgia because what we believe in is what America believes in. We, we believe in the chance to live the dream of this country. I'm a kid that grew up in public housing. I want the chance to live the dream. I want every kid in this country to have the same chance that I had uh, to be able to build a life and go down the path that I wanted to go down. I know you're head of the National Senatorial Campaign Committee now. It's, do you have a sense that that message is resonating in those Georgia races, or do you have any concern about turnout without President Trump on the ballot? Oh, there are people excited. Um, I was down there. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I came in contact with somebody after I came back to Florida, so I uh, I came down. I uh, went down to Georgia to uh, to campaign, and uh, we had a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of interest. We are working hard. People have called. To, they want to go volunteer. They want to campaign. They want to um, give money. They, they want to make sure that that uh, we keep a Republican Senate. So Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue are great candidates, and we're going to have big wins. The president-elect has gone ahead and named some of his cabinet picks, and he's urging the Senate to give his nominees a fair chance. I hope these outstanding nominees received a prompt hearing and that we can work across the aisle in good faith to move forward for the country. Do you expect a Senate fight, though, over any of those nominees, or at least the ones we know so far? So the first step is we got to survive the election. Uh, once that happens, everybody will start looking at, um, you know, the, the next president's um, picks. Here's, here's what's important to me. Honesty, integrity, um, with regard to uh, fiscal responsibility, they understand that we have twenty-seven trillion dollars for the debt. Do they understand that Medicare is not funded, Social Security is not funded, the Federal Reserve is out of control with the seven trillion dollar budget? Do they understand that we've got to stand up to places like Iran and Communist China? Uh, they're clearly not our they're clearly our, our our adversaries now. So I'm going to look at all these things, and when uh, when I look at uh, any picks uh, that come up uh, from any president, assuming that. Biden is the next president, just for a moment. Is there something that you'd be hoping to work with him on, specifically for the American people? Look, I, I ran for the first time in 2010 because I believe in the dream of this country. I, we need to create an economy that we can create more jobs. You do that by lower taxes, less regulation, uh, let people lead their lives. Unfortunately, the Democrats want to tell you how to lead your lives instead of let you go lead your life. And so I, I, want, to build, I want to build this economy so... People have a, a better opportunity going forward. Um, as, as we know, under the Obama years, we didn't have great growth. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm afraid that if we go back to policies like the Obama policies, we'll be in the same position again, where, where if you start out poor, you don't have much of a chance in this country because there's not, there's not a lot of job creation. Yeah, and do you think that he'd be able to sort of keep his moderate stance that he took um, – toward the latter part of the campaign? Would he be able to keep that as president and try to work with both sides of the aisle like he said he would do? I wouldn't work with anybody that's going to help my state. Um, so I've, I've worked well with uh, President Trump. Uh, he understands the issues of Florida. Um, I know that Joe Biden doesn't know much about Florida. And the biggest thing we need is we need a good economy. And Joe Biden has, has no idea how to create an economy. What he, If you look at his is uh, his background is he's, he's big on taxes and he's big on regulation. Both of those things are going to be bad for jobs. If he doesn't win a second term right now, would you like to see President Trump run again in 2024? Absolutely. I think I think uh, President Trump has worked his butt off. I mean, if you look at if you look at the economy before COVID, if you look at if you look at what he did in the Middle East, if you look at his ability to hold. Uh, uh, adversaries accountable. If you look at ability to get uh, NATO to put more money up uh, for uh, for the NATO alliance, I mean, there's a lot of great things uh, the president accomplished. The deregulation, and absolutely. One last thing um, to maybe maybe end on a hopeful note: <laughs> um, the vaccines that appear to be just around the corner. Are you? hopeful about the state of the nation, even though right now there are so many uh, restrictions being reimposed? Well, first off, I believe in masks. I believe in social distance. I believe if you're, you're around somebody tested positive, you ought to quarantine. I believe you ought to be test, getting tested to make sure that you don't make anybody sick. Um, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, uh, the vaccine. So I think, 
I think that that we've got to figure out how to open our economy. And I'm excited that the vaccine is going to uh, is going to give people uh, a lot of safety um, and and help because I know we have to open this economy, but we've got to do it in a safe manner. Senator Rick Scott, get well soon. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Thank you very much for your Happy time. Happy Thanksgiving. It's going to be a nice Thanksgiving. This is Robert Jeffress with your Fox News commentary. Coming up. Thanksgiving's tomorrow. Another tradition that's being changed by the coronavirus pandemic this year, at least for families following the advice of federal health officials like Surgeon General Dr. Jerome Adams. Make sure you're setting up to, uh, to maintain six feet of social distance, limiting your number of guests, ideally to less than 10, and then ventilation. Outside is better than inside, and here in Washington, D.C., it's actually going to be about 60 degrees, warm enough to be outside. The Centers for Disease Control is advising people to not travel for the holiday this year. Despite that advice, a lot of people like Todd Gross at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport say they'll take their chances. I'm not letting this hamper my lifestyle in life. You know, family and friends are more are really important to me at this time of the year. And he's not alone. A lot of people have chosen to do it despite uh, CDC guidelines. Carly Shimkus is a reporter for Fox News Headlines 24-7. An estimated 50 million people are expected to travel this year. It was 55 million last year, so that's you know pretty close to what happened last year. The difference is that people are choosing to travel mostly by car. So 95% of travel will likely be vehicle travel. This is according to AAA. Uh, 2.4 million people will fly, which is a pretty sharp decline from 4.6 million last Thanksgiving. So it seems like a lot of people are going to be getting together, uh, but they are staying more local and they're going to save those big cross-country trips for next year. What they're saying, what I'm learning about airports, is that it's not the, the flying that's so dodgy. It's just being at the airport. You're, you're waiting around in an enclosed space with a bunch of people who may or may not be good about wearing masks. Uh, it's the elevators. It's the terminals, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, airlines have been very um, open and they've promoted the fact that they have HEPA filtration systems. So a lot of doctors have even come out and said that being on the airplane itself is relatively safe. But the part that the CDC doesn't want people to do is just congregate in airports or really congregate at all. And of course, when you are traveling via air or car, that means that you are going to meet other people and other family members and friends. And that's something that uh, the CDC does not particularly want people to do this year. That's the travel. Now let's talk about when you get where you're going. A lot of these recommendations seem fairly reasonable, I guess. Keep your gathering as low as possible. I, I mean, I guess the really safest recommendation is to keep it within your you know, so-called bubble, but people are obviously not doing that. The idea of getting together at grandma's house and staying six feet apart from everybody. I don't know how you grew up, but that's not, that's not a possibility. It was knee to knee at, at, a, at a table. Yeah. And that's that, you know, that's what Thanksgiving, that's what people love about Thanksgiving is, you know, sharing food and getting together and watching football on the same couch. And um, the CDC uh, guidelines do not want you to do any of that. As a matter of fact, they recommend that people bring their own food their own drinks, their own plates, utensils. So they say no sharing this Thanksgiving. And they also suggest that masks should be worn when people aren't eating or drinking. And then, of course, there are the state guidelines. You know, in New York, your Governor Cuomo has capped the limit on Thanksgiving to 10 people. Um, in Oregon, that number is capped at six. And that's where things have really gotten controversial because you have sheriffs who say, I'm not going to enforce those rules. I'm not going to, you know, knock on someone's door and say, you have 15 people in your house, five have to leave. And so then there's been this big back and forth, especially in New York with Governor Cuomo saying, you know, it's not the sheriff's responsibility to choose which laws he wants to enforce and which ones that they don't. So that's where um, things are getting really sticky. So with that said, I think the pandemic and its restrictions will be on the minds of a lot of people tomorrow. A lot of Zoom meetings this Thanksgiving, a lot of FaceTime. Uh, I guess that's another option. Zoom, I guess, uh, is actually 
unlocking how many people you can have at your gathering on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. So, you know, if you can't meet in person, there is there is always Zoom. Um, and Zoom is actually, like you said, yeah, they're letting people use their service for free on Thanksgiving, uh, usually for the free service, you have a 40-minute limit. So for all of Thursday, they're removing that. They're letting people t- get together on Zoom for as long as they choose. I've also seen a lot of other you know, sort of cute suggestions uh, how to make Zoom Thanksgivings a little more personal. Uh, like you could play games over Zoom or even cook meals over Zoom. And the idea is to cook the same thing so you sort of feel like you're together. But, you know, of course... It is the it's it's a positive thing to be in this digital world where we can connect uh, without being face to face, but it's not exactly the same thing. Now tonight is traditionally, especially for um, maybe younger people, a big, big, big night for bars. People come home from college, people go back to their hometown from wherever they move to, and they see their old buddies at the bars. It's one of the biggest drinking nights of the year, but that's not happening in a lot of places. Yes, and it is specifically not happening in Pennsylvania. So Governor Tom Wolf has said that uh, starting at 5 p.m. tonight, um, bars and restaurants have to stop serving alcohol uh, because, you know, the eve of Thanksgiving is a big one for gathering, especially from younger people that are coming home from college They tend to all get together on uh, Thanksgiving Eve, and the governor wants to stop that from happening. Now, unfortunately for bars and restaurants who are already struggling under, you know, the crippling economic ramifications of uh, all these coronavirus lockdowns, they are, you know, hurting even more because of this. Um, And a lot of, uh, especially in Philadelphia, you know, indoor dining is already um, is already no longer allowed. So. Restaurants and bars in Philadelphia are saying, you know, you, this is this is hurting us to no end. Uh, one of the perks of working at Fox is the Thanksgiving Day Parade. If you're working that day, or even if you're not, some people come in on their day off, and you can watch the parade from inside of our building or from, or from some of the windows. That's going to be a little different this year. Yeah, that's right. And you are correct. That is a big perk of working in the Fox News building. So uh, the good news is that the parade is sort of happening. Uh, the not so great news is that it is going to look very different this year. Um, they have scrapped the 2.5 mile parade route. Uh, they've also scaled back on performances and the number of participants. It's really going to be a very um, TV focused event, meaning it's going to be pre-produced, filmed, recorded uh, throughout this week. The Rockettes will still be performing. And some of the most popular balloons, like, you know, the Snoopy balloon, Elf on the Shelf, um, the Pillsbury Doughboy, boy, they, they'll be in the TV event. But, you know, I commend them for trying to put this on and giving people something exciting to watch uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, just for a minute, though, and then you have to turn back to Fox News, of course. Uh, if the Rockettes are part of anybody's tradition or if anybody ever thought about maybe coming to New York to watch the show, you obviously can't do it this year. Uh, but the Rockettes, I've noticed, are actually doing uh, free performances and free dance classes online so you can take you can do that I did if you not know Christmas. that wow can i just say um last christmas i went over to radio city music hall for um a fox and friends piece and um the rockettes tried to teach me how to kick <laughs> um and i failed miserably so <laughs> kicking and uh stretching in any sort of capacity not my forte you're also too tall I yeah think. that's really the thing that's really the thing you have to be between whatever height and whatever height to be a rockhead in your room. Um, yeah, of, I'm, I about, I'm about a half I, foot above it. <laughs> <laughs> the holidays are tough for a lot of people every year who may just be lonely or just have uncomfortable family situations. It's going to be extra tough this year for people that have been isolated for a long time. Maybe a suggestion, Carly, give a call to Aunt Whoever or yeah. your grandma. Maybe everybody should try that Uh Uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I am so glad that you brought that up because I have been hearing a lot of doctors on TV talking about how even under normal circumstances, November and December can be tough for some people um, to deal with. You know, loneliness, depression sets in for a lot of folks this time of year. And that um, is made even, you know, highlighted even more given the fact that a lot of people throughout this year have been separated and isolated. So absolutely, you know, um, give a phone call, you know, for Christmas, mail the card, uh, take that 
couple moments out of your day to make folks, even if you don't talk to them every single day or, you know, this would be the time to to make them feel special because you never know what people are going through. Uh, what a lot of people are going through is a lot of food insecurity. There are food lines around blocks in some cases. Um, people are usually pretty charitable with food stuff around Thanksgiving, but that's an ongoing situation right now. I had a friend who was complaining about his commute one day. Oh, my God, there's all this traffic. He felt terrible later when he found out that that traffic was uh, two miles of cars waiting to get into a civic center to get boxes of food. People yeah. that never had these problems before. You know, that actually reminds me of um, something that Tyler Perry did um, in Atlanta. He helped a bunch of, fam- and I mean a lot of families. Um, he, His production company handed out a bunch of free food boxes and gift cards. Um, and he funded the whole entire thing himself. And he fed 5,000 families. And people waited in line for almost a full day. There was one woman who waited in line for 18 hours, and she called it a true blessing. Um, but as with every year, you can you know, donate to your local food bank, your church. Uh, a lot of churches do great work, of course, this time of year. You know, Feeding America also does some fantastic stuff. Yeah. All right. So those of us who are thankful enough to be uh, still employed and everything's going relatively well through all this, maybe uh, dig a little bit deeper this year. Carly, uh, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? What's your plans? Oh, okay. So I will be uh, working throughout the uh, week, but on Saturday, I will be cooking my very first turkey, and I have low expectations for success. Similar to my Rockette skills, I expect failure, (laughs) but I'm going to try anyway. I have faith. You can do it. Um, Carly Shemkis, you can see her on Fox News Channel, Fox Business Network. You can hear her on uh, Fox News Headlines 24-7 on Sirius XM. Carly, it was uh, good to talk to you. I miss you. I miss you, too. I can't wait to see you. Give you a hug when you come back. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, subscribe and listen to the Trey Gowdy Podcast. Former federal prosecutor and four-term U.S. congressman from South Carolina brings you a -a one-of-a-kind podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Robert Jeffress. What's on your mind? In October of 1789, George Washington issued our nation's first Thanksgiving proclamation, declaring that Thursday, November 26, would be, quoted, devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. Washington was just a few months into his first term. It was far from clear that our fledgling nation would survive, much less be thriving, over 200 years later. Yet, Washington found much to be thankful for. He called upon Americans to be united in rendering unto God our sincere and humble thanks for what we had. Washington recounted how God's provision had been evident throughout the history of the nation, from settling the colonies to making it through a difficult war. The nation's statesmen had come to a peaceable ratification of the new Constitution. Americans lived in a land with civil and religious liberty. The new president was grateful. Washington also called on the nation to unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions. From the outset, our nation has aspired to be great, but it hasn't ever been perfect. Washington encouraged all Americans to acknowledge this. They were invited to spend Thanksgiving not only in gratitude, but in repentance as well. These responses, gratitude and repentance, don't come naturally to us. Americans have always been a hard-working, industrious people. We're proud of what we make and what we accomplish. We're always striving for more, planning for the next quarter, projecting growth into the future. We've got a natural dissatisfaction with the status quo. Thanksgiving, however, is a way Americans devised in our earliest days to collectively hit pause on the grind and toil of work. 
Instead of being hyper-focused on what we can achieve, we take a day off to look at all the things God has achieved for us. When you look back at the past few decades, we seem to have so much more now than we've ever had. Yet I think we enjoy it much less. This has been going on since well before the pandemic. We experienced incredible economic growth alongside skyrocketing depression, loneliness, and addiction across our nation. Our growing dissatisfaction with life is because of our nation's shrinking belief in God, a fact that is verified by numerous public opinion polls. But Thanksgiving as a holiday makes no sense and serves no purpose without God. You can't be thankful unless you're thankful to someone. You can't see what you have as a gift unless you admit you received it from someone. I'm praying that amidst all the challenges we face this year as a nation, we might return back to that spirit expressed by our first president at the first national Thanksgiving back in 1789. Let's not spend the day simply overeating and hunting for Black Friday deals on our iPhones. Let's set aside some time on Thursday to give thanks to the Lord for His steadfast love, which endures throughout pandemics and political turmoil and into all eternity. This is Robert Jeffress. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. New from the Fox News Podcasts Network. My name is Kennedy, and welcome to my podcast, which will, I humbly say, single-handedly save the world. You're welcome. It's Kennedy Saves the World. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.